Excellent. Welcome. Thank you guys for being here at Inbound. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Got some excited people in the crowd. So let's. I can't believe I'm sitting on stage with Tarana Burke. Uh, Tarana, let's start with you. We'll dive right in. You know, the Me Too movement, the hashtag Me Too became pretty well known in the fall of last year, but it's something that you created and started and have been deeply involved with for quite a bit longer than that. Can you just sort of give an intro as to what the movement really is all about? Yeah, the movement is about what it's always been about, which is supporting survivors of sexual violence and making sure that they have the resources that, that, that we need to start a healing journey or continue a healing journey. And it's also about making sure people are active in the fight to end sexual violence. And so that started in 2006 with um, a small group of girls in Selma, Alabama, because initially, I was trying to find some solutions in my community to the little girls who looked like me who had survived sexual violence. And I was in a space where I was very active politically. I was a community organizer and I was doing youth work and youth leadership work and was having repeated experiences of, of these children who were telling me about how sexual violence had impacted their life. And I would relay those stories to other people in the community and it was always, uh, it never rose to the, to the level of a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. It was always like, oh, we need more guidance counselors in the school or, oh, we need more services, which was true. But at the same time, if you have a large group of young people in your community who all have the same experience, then you have a community problem that needs to be addressed as such. And so Me Too really started as a way to, to, to fill in the gap, there was a deficit. There was nobody speaking. It was like, you know, we all remember in the early 2000s, we all kind of went through our like mindfulness period. <laughs> and we was, everybody was reading The Secret and like <laughs> doing all, I mean, it was good. I'm not really making fun of that, I did it too. And then we were like <laughs> doing our positive affirmations and finding ways to make our lives better. And, and it was a period of time when we were, it was so much talk about being connected to who you are and um, not being uh, the sum of, of the experiences that you had and all these great things that nobody spoke into our community. Nobody spoke hope into our community. Nobody spoke possibility into our community. And I wanted to bring some of the experiences I was having that was helping me become whole again to these young people who were broken in a lot of ways and thought they had to remain broken. And then this miraculous thing happened, which was, I call it our first viral moment. Um, we created a MySpace page. Shout out to MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it was, you know, MySpace was sort of our first introduction to being connected to people around the world. Outside of those like weird chat rooms we had in the AOL days. <laughs> you know, being connected to people in a social way. And when we created the MySpace page, women initially started reaching out to us saying, oh my God, thank you for starting this. Mm -hmm. And how can we bring this to our community? And then it dawned on me as like, oh, I'm a survivor of sexual violence. The two women who helped me do this work were also, of course adults need this. We thought it was just gonna be a youth thing. And it immediately pivoted within a year to us supporting grown women. And it was clear that those grown women needed exactly what the young people needed. Mm -hmm. They needed somebody to speak hope into their life. They needed somebody to say that if you can get on a healing journey, what, you, what also is healing is doing the work to make sure other people don't experience this. Mm -hmm. and, and they needed um, somebody who had vision for what it looks like to be a survivor in a world and not let your life be consumed by trauma. So where did the words Me Too come from? That came from, so I had this experience well before we started. I, I used to run a youth leadership camp, and it was a, quickly enough, there's a girl in the, in the program who I got really close to, and in the course of our relationship, she disclosed to me that she had been sexually, viol sexually abused by her stepfather. And um, I was 21, which I always feel like I have to preface it by saying I was a kid, but, but you know, in those moments, you don't feel I was an adult counselor. Anyway, when she came to me, she cornered me and was just like, Miss Tarana, you know, she just started pouring out what had happened to her. And I was like a deer in headlights. I was just like, I didn't know what to say. In my mind, I was thinking, you know, I'm not a social worker. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. I don't know what to say. 
And, you know, if you work with kids or you've been around kids, the number one thing you don't want to do is mess them up, right? <laughs> you don't want to say the thing that's going to have them, like, on a corner with a cup, like, Mr. Ron, if you'd have just told me the right way. <laughs> you know, like, I was just always scared that I was going to do the wrong thing. And so when she was saying this, literally in the moment when she was saying, and I was just like, I don't know what to say. But in the back of my mind, what I was saying, what my heart was saying is that this happened to me too. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't feel like enough. It didn't feel like enough to give her that was going to do anything. But the more I thought about it after she left was like, what would, would have been, what would have been one thing that somebody could have said to me at that age where I was also dealing with being a survivor that could have changed the tra trajectory of my life? And it would have been that you're not alone that you're not the only one this happened to, that this happens to so many people, that you're, there's nothing wrong with you, right? And it would have changed my life to be seen mm -hmm. and to be heard and to be believed. And oddly enough, I just want to add this, that, you know, I, I tell that story a lot because it's really where those literal words came from because I felt haunted by saying, I just wanted to be like, yeah, me too. But uh, um, I'm in touch with a lot of the young people I've worked with at when Me Too went viral and I was telling this story on TV and I was crying, one of my kids reached out to me and said, Miss T, because these are, you know, the loving ways that they address me. <laughs> She's like, Miss T, why are you always crying on TV? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, it was just one time. But anyway, <laughs> she said, you know, I hear you telling this story. I called a girl heaven in yeah. publicly. It's like, I hear you telling this story about heaven and how you keep calling yourself a failure because you didn't know what to say to her. And so I met, that incident happened in 96. This child I'm talking about, I met in 98. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, when I met you, you were the second person I ever told what happened to me, but you were the first person to believe me. Mm -hmm. And she was like, that's why I'm still here. That's why I'm still around. That's why you can't get rid of me because the moment you believed me, it changed my whole life around. Mm -hmm. So stop talking about the failure and talk about the success. So that's, that's where the words come yeah. from. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you talk about not wanting to mess somebody up, mm -hmm. but the reason we're here is because we've not done enough no. to not create messed up people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which kind of leads me, Emily, to your book and part of the reason that you're here, which is, you know, we talked about the Me Too movement becoming uh, so prominent in the fall, despite all the work that um, Toronto had done previously. And that sort of accelerated the publication of your book, which talks about you know, some of these similar topics in the tech industry in Silicon Valley in particular. So um, can you just talk a little bit about why and how that came to be in your experience reporting the book the way that you did? Yeah. Um, so I started writing the book before I knew Me Too existed, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, before Trump got elected, before Harvey Weinstein. And the genesis of the story I was trying to tell was the fact that women are completely underrepresented in, in technology, which is this world-changing industry that touches all of our lives. Um, and no one was talking about it. And I had heard some stories here and there, but, um, you know, women weren't coming forward and mm -hmm. telling them, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a journalist, and so I'd hear a lot of things off the record, but nobody ever wanted to share their stories on the record. Um, and at the end of 2015, I was interviewing a particular investor, um, Chapter 5, <laughs> and this is a firm that had no women partners at the time, and I said, what do you think your responsibility is there to hire more women? And he said, oh, we're looking very hard, but we're not prepared to lower our standards. <gasps> <laughs> on television. There's a clip. You can go find it. Um, and honestly, I, I actually felt for a moment someone had told me the truth <laughs> yeah. of what the problem really was. People, and many men believe, they have to lower their standards to hire talented women. And so for me, that was kind of the spark that lit the fire that got me to write the book. And as I started talking to people, you know, I, I'm not used to interviewing people on camera, and so I was having all of these off-camera conversations and hearing these stories that just made my jaw fall on the floor. And I was like, how come nobody is talking about this? But mm. the reporting of it was really, really difficult. There was no sort of um, structure. There was no sort of set way that you do this. And women just didn't come forward like that, and they certainly didn't attach their name to the stories. 
Um, and then about a year into my reporting process is when Susan Fowler, uh, who's an engineer at the time, she was an engineer at Uber, published this long missive about sexual harassment that she experienced. And um, it was the first domino in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley to fall. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, I was in the middle of writing this book and I had 12 women engineers over at my home for dinner and none of them were surprised. You know, yeah. they'd all, they all had their stories. Mm. And what Susan did was give other women the courage to come forward and share yep. those stories. Yep. And I think a lot of people actually don't know that you, there were women coming forward in Silicon Valley before Harvey Weinstein. There were several investors who were exposed in that summer. And then you had Harvey Weinstein and, and, and the Me Too movement just took off. And my editor said to me, um, we need your book like tomorrow. <laughs> and I, you know, I've never written a book before. And I was just, no, I mean, how can I do that? Uh, but we really just kicked into overdrive. And it was like keeping up with, I mean, the train was just moving so fast. There yep. was story after story yep. after story after yep. story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they like ran the script, the manuscript to the printing press um, as soon as I gave it to them because they, you know, I said, but the story's happening now. They're like, but people want to read it now. Yep. Mm. Um, and so we moved it up about five or six months. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well done. Yeah. Um, a couple questions. I guess I would love both of your opinions on just sort of like, why now? Like, why did the, like, the Harvey Weinstein story really break the door open in the sense that it became such a flood of conversation? Mm -hmm. And then I'll follow up after that. <laughs> I mean, I, I get this question all the time. I think that we've seen a, a momentum building, right? And I think it, it always bothers me when people say 2017 and 2018 is the year that women found their voices. And I'm like, we've been talking. Yeah. <laughs> women, women have had voices <laughs> forever, right? It's actually, I think what happened in these last two years is that people have finally found a frequency that they can hear us. Yeah. Because there's been no shortage of women standing up. There's been no shortage of women coming forward. The difference is they weren't believed. They weren't investigated. It wasn't interrogated before. And so I think between the election and then the uh, like women's march happening and all the momentum of that, there was a, a, a growing sense of power um, and possibility. I know I, I talk about possibility a lot, but possibility is so important. If you, the, the Weinstein story, um, breaking, or even if you go back to uh, Gretchen Carlson mm -hmm. and then the Uber story, and then it was like a series of stories that broke and they didn't get treated like the Cosby story, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, the Cosby story got a wave of pushback from all different directions, even with, though there were like 60 women. So these stories were coming up and there was a, a building momentum, and I think as, as, as women in particular, of course it was more than just women, saw that, oh, wait a minute, this person wasn't like excoriated for coming out with this story. More people came out and more people came out. And then the Weinstein story coming out in two major legacy publications back to back with credible people from Hollywood. Like I get, I get asked a lot about do I get upset about the white women in Hollywood. I'm not, I'm not mad at that because nobody was going to listen to a 44-year-old black woman from the Bronx screaming about sexual violence. Mm. I have evidence. <laughs> <laughs> they have not listened, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened is that because you had A-list actresses and we are so invested in the lives of celebrity, right? We want to know what they're wearing, what they're dressing, who they're marrying, who they're cheating with. We want to know everything about their lives. This, these stories came forward and it was like salacious on the one hand, it was intriguing on the other hand, and it was familiar. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what opened the floodgates of people being like, okay, this is a moment. And sometimes you just don't know. You don't know the place at the time. And so... Me Too going viral was really, I think, people trying to find an entry point to saying, I recognize this behavior. I've recognized it all along, and now I have a way to express it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think the Weinstein story, too, in particular, was the egregiousness of the cover-up, the enablers, the ignoring, the denying, and mm -hmm. the so many people that were involved in just not allowing this to be exposed. Yeah. Um, you know, there have been so many incredible, brave journalists. Ronan, Ronan Farrow is not here, but, but he, he is one of them. But mm -hmm. there were many journalists who decided not to cover the, the Bill yeah. Cosby sexual assaults. And so I think, you know, the media has a big role to play. I mean, I also think, 
you know, politics aside, President Trump was elected just weeks after a tape leaked about him bragging yes. about sexually assaulting women. Yes. And, and I think that was a bridge too far. Too. I, I, you know, I think yeah. women were furious, yeah. quite frankly. And many women voted for, for, mm -hmm. for Donald Trump. This is not about who you voted for. Um, yes, it is. But that led to the... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Keep going, keep going. I'm a journalist. Yes, I forgot. I'm a journalist. I'm not. Um, <laughs> but go ahead, you're right. But women were furious yeah. and emboldened, and that's why you had women marching in the streets for the first time since the, the actual women's movement. Mm. Yeah. You know, why did it take so long? Yeah. Um, and so I think it, it, it almost took that to get the floodgates no, okay. it, that's what I mean. It was like a perfect storm. You had all of these things happening one behind another. I do think, though, that the, the Trump, the tapes coming out and the, the election happening after that was just, it just felt like, and, and I, you, you could feel it in the air. It was like a bridge too far. Like, yeah. really? We're going to let this happen as well? Right. This man is literally talking about how he commits sexual crimes and sexual violence. And we're just like, okay. But then again, this is the person who said he could shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue and still get elected. So... Well, and it's a per perfect example of this is a problem that has not been solved. <laughs> Correct. There are still no consequences <laughs> Correct. for many, many people. And I have a pile of tips on my desk that, you know, I'll never get through. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the investors that I've been involved in exposing, I mean, those stories took months. Mm -hmm. You're talking about someone's life, someone's career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't take that lightly. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ronan Farrow's been working on a huge story for months. He's always working on a huge story. <laughs> like, it takes a really long time to, yeah. to, to expose one person because every single, and I've experienced with talking to these women, you know, they have their stories and they don't want to come forward because there's still risk involved. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, in the one particular story that I did, it, there were six women involved and, you know, it was back and forth, texts, dinners, phone calls, having them talk to each other. And there were so many times where I was like, I'm never going to be able to do this story. Yep. Because it yep. really depends on them finding the collective courage mm -hmm. to, to do so. Yep. There's a couple common denominators. Like, there, you know, you've both talked about, like, oh, no one's talking about it. Well, yes, they really are. Like, that's mm -hmm. just not true. Like, that's, that's become very clear now. And I think the Me Too movement, but almost in particular the Me Too hashtag and yeah. the ability to do that on social media has created a very clear visual space that it's like, this is happening and this is happening everywhere. Yeah. So rather than sit here and just like belabor that point, le like, what can we do about it? Let's talk a little bit about that. And like, from both of your perspectives, it's like, what needs to be done now that it is obviously a problem and that's pretty hard to fight back at that the problem exists. How do we start making motion forward to correct some of that? That's the, All yeah. of that. So, so the challenge for me is that I think that it has been, people know that there's a problem, but I'm not sure that they're really actually identifying the problem. Mm -hmm. There's a spectrum of sexual violence. And the, the focus has been largely on sexual harassment in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I'm very much of the school of call a thing a thing. And so, you know, in the Harvey Weinstein case, that to read those cases, case, story after story after story, and to come away with sexual harassment in the workplace is problematic to me. Mm -hmm. These are stories of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. These are stories of him in hotel rooms, kicking in people's apartment doors. These are, we have to call it what it is. Because what I feel like has happened is that a lot of the attention has, and it should be, it should be on sexual harassment in the workplace, but it should also be on sexual harassment walking down your street. Mm -hmm. It should be on sexual harassment in churches and in schools. Sexual harassment creates the culture for sexual violence to, to, to happen. Yep. And so the, the, the challenge that I, that I feel like we're faced with right now is that we have to really step back for a second. This is my, this is my personal take on it, but... I'm really frustrated at the fact that what people are calling the Me Too movement is not actually a movement. Mm -hmm. Movements aren't built in the media. And what people are calling the Me Too movement is what the media created, mm -hmm. right? There was a series of events that happened. You had Weinstein, you had the viral hashtag, you had the media going, oh my God, look at all the people saying Me Too, and then immediately pivot away and not talk about those people. Yep. And so really what happened is a year ago, millions of people around the world raised their hand and said, you know what, I identify with that. I was abused as a child. I was raped in college. I was, whatever your circumstance was, this happened to me too. And the, the volume of people that said that elevated this to an international issue 
and yet we still just talk about one piece of it. Mm -hmm. And so those of us who do this work are left to support the survivors and try to figure out what they need. And so at this point, really what people are doing are trading on the labor of people who survive sexual violence. It's labor to come forward and say that this thing happened mm -hmm. to you. It took labor for people to even write a hashtag. Mm -hmm. And that's being ignored. It's largely being ignored. You don't see stories in the media about everyday people who are dealing with the variety of sexual violence. So what has to happen, number one, is that we have to shift the narrative. We have to shift the narrative away from, this is a movement about who's gonna be next? Who, who's gonna get Me Too'd? And who's the Me Too movement gonna, that's nonsense. And it's so distracting and it's so damaging when actually there are people who are harmed and who are being harmed currently or who have been harmed and who are holding pain inside the pit of their stomach and nobody's talking about that. Mm -hmm. Nobody's addressing it. Mm -hmm. And although I have a lot of visibility, the work that we're doing is still relatively isolated from this larger sort of circus. Mm -hmm. And so if ever you leave here with anything, to, anything today in terms of what you can do, you can talk about this movement differently. Talk about the reality of the Me Too movement, which is the millions of people who said Me Too who were not talking about being chased around their desk, who were not talking about rude jokes at work, who were not talking about just policies that do need to be changed. We need to look at the breadth of sexual violence and how pervasive it is in this country. And it affects the workplace, mm -hmm. and it affects how we work and interact with each other. But it's really, a, this is about people's human dignity, and we are talking about all this other stuff. It's really, it's depressing to see. It's so challenging for me to, to every day to be like, okay, I'm going to answer these dumb questions, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about something else. Not yours, your question. <laughs> no, I'm, I didn't mean, I mean like in the world, I got not like, yeah. <laughs> I um, might ask a dumb one, we'll see. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, what people can do is listen yeah. and don't be a bystander. Like if you see something, whether it's at work or at home mm -hmm. or in somebody else, you know, do something. Yep. So many people, we, like, we, can't, we all know this is a problem now. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Ignorance at this point can only be willful. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so many people think that they are not part of the problem. And I think mm -hmm. there really has to be kind of a reckoning there. I mean, we all have bias. Yeah. Um, we all have our own life perspective. Um, and, and, and we all, misogyny, patriarchy, women and men both suffer under that. Mm -hmm. Women and men are both, I get as many complaints from women about how the Me Too movement is unfair as I do from men. Mm -hmm. And so there's an unlearning that has to happen about the realities of, of, of what creates th these, these, these situations, right? Yeah. Has, there's an unlearning that we have to do about, we've all been socialized to believe certain things and to, you know, our understandings of, of, of how men and women should interact and all of that is, is really, really, really steeped in patriarchy and that has to be undone. And that's a big job. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. But I, I, Tarana and I were actually talking about this a little bit backstage. Emily, I would love your thoughts too, is, you know, I think sometimes this conversation comes up and there's people that are like, I want, let's talk about it, I'm ready. Like, how do we fix it? Yes, yes, yes. And then there's people who are like, what are you talking about? This doesn't exist. You know, they're very defensive. And I think sometimes the words come up, you know, feminist comes up and it's like ears shut. Like it's a or curse. <laughs> ears, eyes, everything. It's like, nope, I'm not going to talk about this. Even the, even sexual abuse or sexual assault or sexual harassment, it's like, I'm not going to talk about this. You know, do you have thoughts on how we can adjust or rethink sometimes the way we're having the conversation and even the words that we're using or the language around it that makes it um, more open and welcoming to people to be a part of to for them to listen and be open to the idea of having the conversation. So who's a feminist? <laughs> I mean, this is like not a bad word, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we need to, I do think we need to create safe spaces where people can talk about this. And sometimes it's hard to talk about without saying something that makes someone feel a little uncomfortable. And I think yeah. we need to be a little flexible yeah. as we're trying to find the language right. Both of us. Um, with which we can have these conversations. But I actually think the discomfort is a good thing. I mean, all of this has been bottled up for so centuries, yeah. for a very, very long time. And... In my view, and, and I'm optimistic about this because I don't think I could keep doing this if I wasn't, but we're going to come out of this in a better place. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, 
it's going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. It has to. It's uncomfortable for everybody. One of the things we were talking about backstage is that I, over the years, have, have figured out how to be strategic about having these conversations. Yeah. Um, I think you really have to go into them with strategy. And so um, one of the things I do, is, particularly when I talk to men, is instead of talking about sexual violence and the spectrum of sexual violence and patriarchy and privilege, and, I talk about dignity, right? And, and when you're talking about harassment or uh, assault or abuse, you're talk, I talk about dignity, I talk about humanity. Because really what it is, take away the, the sexual part of it, it's about power and overpowering people and it's about chipping away at somebody's humanity, dehumanizing them. It's about, about uh, diminishing their dignity. Nobody wants that. Nobody of any gender, however you identify, wants to feel less human, wants to have somebody else make them take away from their humanity. And nobody wants to have their dignity, you know, um, chipped away at. And so if you, can, if you can hone in on that and understand that what happens, and it is about conversations. I think we do have to have open conversations where men listen and women listen. I think men have to hear the reality of holding the weight of being a woman. I, I had a session one time with young people, teenagers in high school, where the girls described in detail what it was like coming to school and the decisions they make, starting with getting dressed in the morning. What day is it today? Oh, this is the day that we have gym, and so all the boys are going to be lined up down at the locker room. I better not wear this oh, should I go this way down the hall or that way down the hall? Because this is what, you know, and I made them listen to what the girls, all the different decisions, and even the girls themselves had to pull out from them, like, talk about what decision you made when you turn that corner. What decision are you making when you go home from school? Should you ride this bus? Should you go this way? Women have to think of so, make all these decisions about our protection in the course of a day that men never think about. And, and why would they, right? That's not their life. So sometimes they have to hear that. Conversely, I think men have to hear, I mean, women have to hear the fear that men have. Men don't have space to be fearful. They don't have space to express vulnerability. They don't have space to be like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I'm just out here and I'm hoping that I kind of want to touch a titty, but I feel like, <laughs> if I do that, you know, like, like it's, it's, it's crude and I'm sorry to be, I hope that, there's no children in here anyway, right? <laughs> hope you don't bring your children. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, I think it's, it sounds, it, we get frustrated because we hear that kind of thing and we're like, oh my God, you Neanderthal, you dummy, yeah. you that. And it's like, no, let them get it out. Let them get it out. Sometimes they have to hear themselves yeah. say this nonsense, right, out loud. And be like, oh yeah, that does sound kind of crazy. Like you, you, and, and when I talk to like, in the terms of companies, in terms mm -hmm. about like, I didn't want to do anything around HR or talk to any corporate people. When I first started, I was like, I'm an activist. <laughs> this is not my world. And then I got convinced to do this, um, this conference with a bunch of HR professionals, and I listened to them talk about the, the ways that they're approaching things after the Me Too movement, and I was like, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> and my question was, you all are thinking about how you change policies now that Me Too has gone viral. You're trying to think about how you shift culture inside. And I'm like, has anybody thought about how you bring people in the company? Like, what about your company and the way it's set up makes people feel comfortable to come in and behave this way? So you got to start at the root. You got to start at where this is a, what's the culture that exists there? And I think, I'm probably way off the topic You're now, fine. but I think that's the same thing <laughs> about going. the way we interact with each other. We got to start at the root causes of these things, how we're raising our boys and how we're raising our girls and how we talk about interactions and social, you know, all of this kind of stuff. You got to kind of chip away at it, but it's going to take time. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You have to get into the nuances. You got to really, like, I have a friend, excuse me for cursing again, who always <laughs> says, you got to fuck with the grays. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite things that he says because the gray area is where most of us live. Yeah. You know? I, you know, and I think so much of this can be done in workplace workplaces and should be but also these are conversations we are all having with each other yeah. whether it's yeah. your husband or your mm -hmm. partner or your boyfriend or your kids I have three boys I have three sons mm -hmm. um, you know I think their lives will be better if we can figure this out in yeah. a, if we if we all live in in a more equal world but I've had you know when I heard first first heard the stories of now men are scared 
They don't want right. to be wor working alone with women or traveling with women. And I'm just, <laughs> and I, I was so angry. Right. And I just kind of had to like let that go <laughs> because, you know, there, there are a lot of good guys. I mean, my husband even said to me, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I, do, I don't know. Like, can I give this person a hug? Can I say but they that, look nice? Is that this, okay? This, it's so, I get it. I get the fear. I try to get it at least. But also I'm always like, what were you doing in September of 2017? Who, what we, how were you dating? Like, I don't know. That guy, the actor who was like, I don't know if I can date now because I might be accusing me. Come on. Was anybody I mean, accusing you of rape before? I, I do think in general. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not, I mean. People know where the line is. They know where the line is. They know where the line yeah. is. But I, I think that we do have to be a little bit more forgiving in these conversations. No, I mean, that's what I'm. Nobody's used to talking about. Yes, it is. It's, that's what I'm saying. But it also, I mean, I get both sides. There's a frustration around. First of all, I want to tell men, calm down. <laughs> calm down, right? <laughs> Let's just take a deep breath. Look around. Talk to the women around you. Talk to your friends and your colleagues and your family. Most women, most women have a really uh, common sense approach to this. Most women are, are like, I just want to be able to exist in the world without somebody randomly touching me. I want you to ask consent before you decide to enter my body. I want you to, like these are really basic <laughs> things that we're asking. If you stop acting scared and just hear what the, what the, listen to the stories and hear what it is people are asking for, again, it goes back to I want to be able to walk with my own, with my dignity. Mm -hmm. I want to exist as a human being and not ha and have my humanity intact. You want the same things. These men and women and trans people and people who, however you identify, we all basically want as a, as a really, really basic level, we want the same things. If we stop getting like, I'm not, I would never touch a woman. I would never, I'm not that kind of guy. Okay, how many rape jokes have you laughed at? How many guys, how many stories have you listened to about a guy talking about some horribly crude thing that they did and you kind of chuckled, even if you mm -hmm. cringed inside, right? So we can pull back the layers and we can listen, but at some point there's gonna have to be some courageousness that, that gets introduced in the end. You gotta make the first step to be like, yeah. I, I gotta be different. And that's what I say about, you know, don't be a bystander, you know, right. mm -hmm. do something. Like when you see someone getting interrupted or if you hear one of these crude jokes, call it out. Right. And it doesn't have to be mean, mm -mm. but even a little small, you know, all right, all right, Cut that's not cool. Or I want to, I won't, actually, I want to finish hearing what she has to say. Like that actually goes a really long way. And that is something that we all can do. And it's nice when men do it too, and don't no, leave men, it to the, yeah, that's the only woman it. in the room yeah. to have yeah. to say like, "Please don't do no. that." Yeah. But and exactly, it's a, it's a lot easier for the person who is not the victim or the person who is not Correct. in the minority to be the one to speak up. Yeah, but but this, I was with a, a CEO of a company at this event, and he was so impressed by telling me that he is doing all this work. I'm just really trying to get as many women and minorities in the positions as possible. I'm getting, I'm just shoving, it's getting them in the door. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> the and I was, yeah. And I was like, that's not a good idea. Hmm. And so I'm not accountable. You know, again, I'm just activists <laughs> and, 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 I, and, I, and I'm just invited to this thing. Right. Cause everybody's like, Ooh, the me too lady. <laughs> and, and I was, Sitting, literally sitting on a boat listening to these corporate people, and he was very impressed with himself. I, you can, I, we, we're cool now because we had to have this conversation. And he said, um, he was like, what do you mean? This, it's about diversity. And I was like, what's the culture in your company? Yeah. What are, the, what are the principles and values that your company actually upholds? Do you know, just because you put a woman in place does not mean that that's a woman who's going to open doors for other women. Just because you put a person of color in it doesn't mean that they believe in bringing other people up, right? So that's not a solution. <laughs> and I think, I think what's happening in this moment is everybody's so heavy-handed, right? It's like, did you get an accusation? Fire them. Get rid of them. Look, we don't have any Me Too issues. Look at us. Or look, we have, we have 100 women in place, and half of those women could be like women who, who climb the ladder and close the door behind them. Yep. So it's really about establishing what your values are, what you, who as a, what as a, if you're a company that values diversity and you really value diversity, that means you are going to take your time to make sure that every person that you bring in mirrors those values, regardless of what they look like. And you got to balance it out. You got to have the women and the men and the gays and the, all of the, 
that's probably not politically correct, but you know what I mean. They have, <laughs> you have to have a little bit of everybody. But you have to do that. There's a, it's like what you were saying about um, the men saying they have to lower their standards to bring women in. You don't have to lower your standards. There are people who share your values. There are people who share your values and have the skills to do the job well. You just got to take the time to look for them. 1,000%. Yeah. 1,000%. And, and I, I, I got I this think... corporate thing down, y'all. <laughs> I got it down. The CEO of the right, Me Too movement here. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> but the earlier that you talk about your values, write them down, yeah. those things get forged into the culture of your company. And it is so much easier to do that when you're small than when you're big. Mm. Yep. It's really hard to turn around an aircraft carrier. Yep. It is, it is so hard. And so the earlier on that you are explicit about it, yeah, I, there are people who don't look like you who share your values mm -hmm. all over the world. Yep. Um, and if you take the time in, in investing in, in finding the right people early on, you're going to save time Later. down the line. That makes sense. You're going to be able to move more quickly because you do have a diverse team. Right. You don't have blind spots. You do have a strong culture and a strong foundation. What struck me when you guys were both talking was like, it's sort of this idea that it's like, it's not an advertising campaign. It's like, right. it has to be real. What also kind of struck me is, for better or for worse, like, this is a conversation that we're having right now and we've been having for a little while, but like, there is sometimes this feeling of like, what's the shelf life? Like, how do we keep this conversation alive and well and continued before the next thing comes along that we're all talking about and it sort of falls a little bit by the wayside? What are your thoughts on, like, you know, in particular, Me Too, mm -hmm. but also just the general idea of, like, gender parity and gender equality and, and just overall inclusion and representation in everything that we do and not letting that go away in terms of conversation that we're all having? Yeah. So, again, I get, I get this question a lot, and I think I'm okay with... Me too. I, I have every expectation that people were going to talk about it less and less, and it's going to be in the media less and less, right? Because that's how media works, and that's how pop culture works. What I hope is that people will invest in it now. I hope that we are, one of the things I like to say to people is that we cannot be validated by what the media has for us. This, can't, this movement is not a movement because of media. This movement is a, movements happen in, uh, you know, in, in pieces. And so for me, this is a blip on the map. This is a moment in a long-standing movement. And not just the work I did over 12 years. I'm talking about the long-standing movement to end sexual violence. It has been going on for decades. And so I had an entry in 2005 in that movement with Me Too and doing this work. There's, there are dozens and hundreds of people who are doing this work. This moment we're able to, to galvanize and we're able to take advantage of and we're able to build upon and hopefully move some resources, which is not happening, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, but we're able to, 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 to uh, what's the word, leverage this moment to do more work. My hope is that the people who have seen it now, you, like you said, you can't unsee it, mm. you can't unknow it. So when it's out of the media and when it's not on the news every night and when it's not about who's the next person taken down and you hear about it and you see it in your community and you see it around you, you need to, to be ready to be active about it and to be proactive in working to end sexual violence and support survivors without it being undergirded by something that's in the news. And so I think it's okay. I'm actually ready for that to happen. I think that's okay. It'll be a time when I can't talk to a room of however many thousands of people, but if I can even still talk to a hundred people and those hundred people talk to a hundred people, that's how movements grow. If I was to invest in this moment to be how we're gonna ride the movement for the rest, it would not be a movement. This, what's happening right now is not sustainable. It's not a sustainable model to be like, on, on tonight's heart, you know, news in the Me Too movement, this person happened and that, that's not sustainable. That will die. Mm -hmm. that, this, that, it's just, it's no, it's no way for it not to. That will go away. That will move on. This work will not die. This work will not end. And what has happened because Me Too went viral is that the field has been woken up. People have been woken up and they're looking I just think about it as like people walking around in the dark, like, okay, you open me up, I've told my truth, I've come for it, it's safe now, what now? We are doing the work of the what now. The rest of it will go away and that's fine. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to become part of our 
DNA and our reflexive mm-hmm. response that A, we don't tolerate this and B, we believe, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, on, it's the burdens on the other person to prove that that did not happen. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, and, and, and my focus is the workplace, um, I don't think culture is fundamentally going to change until numbers change. Mm-hmm. Until what and change? numbers oh, okay. change. And so, like, if you have 10 men around a dinner table, the conversation is a certain way. You hear more of those crude <laughs> jokes. You add in one woman and it changes a little maybe. But it, if, if it's half and half, it's a completely different conversation. Yeah. And in my mind, that's where we, we need to work towards that. Because until, you know, our companies are more diverse, um, we are not going to have that real culture shift. I mean, in Silicon Valley in particular, so many of these things are problems because our women are in the minority over and over and over again. They're the only woman in the room, the only woman at the bar, the only woman at the offsite. They're getting these sexual advances 24 seven. And you know, that can lead to very bad things yeah. um, as we've seen. And so, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that need to happen. It's oh, not yeah. going to happen overnight. It's going to take work. Yep. Um, but until um, we have a greater diversity of, 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 of the teams and the companies that we work in, in the workplace, we're not going to see men and women on equal footing. In terms of the like right now, like we've got an audience full of people here, <laughs> they're going to walk out the door. If there was one thing to say, you're going to take away from this, this discussion, but also like I'm going to go do this one thing to help create some amount of change. What do you think is top of that list? Yeah. Um, I would say don't settle for the status quo. Like it doesn't have to be this way, but it's not going to change unless we're all involved, mm-hmm. men and women. We all need to be part of this conversation, but it doesn't have to be this way. It can be so much better. Yep. Um, I would say look for the gaps. Mm. I tell people this all the time, and part of the work that we're building is to help people do that. But there are, I started doing this work because there was a deficit in my community. There, was, there were huge gaps, and those gaps are everywhere. There's no one organization, there's no silver bullet, there's no one person that's going to be able to tie this all up. But look around you. Everybody does have a role. Everybody can play a part. Even if, it's, if you work at a company, how many of you know the sexual harassment policy of your company? When's the last time you read it all the way through? Maybe get a couple of people together, sit around and get some coffee or some vodka, whatever you like, and read that policy. Make sure you read have it. a policy. Oh, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> write it down. One, right? But, and, but then think about that versus your lived experience in that space. Wherever it is, whether it's your job or church, whatever it is, think about your lived experience and what policies are in place that would cover you. If something happened, would it cover what you've experienced? Like that's a way to fill in the gaps. If you're a parent, think about the, 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 the number of people that your child interacts with from the time they leave your house to the time they come home. What's the, what are the protections? Really, the, this work is about making our communities less and less and less vulnerable to sexual violence. We all can play some role in that. So look for gaps, look for them around you. In terms of our work, I'm gonna just say this because we, we only got two minutes left. Yep. In terms of our work, the, the Me Too movement, MeTooMVMT.org, that's our work, the work that has been going on since 2005. What has happened since uh, Me Too went viral is that we've been conflated with a lot of things, right? We get conflated with Time's Up, which is a great organization, but it's not our work. It is something separate. And they raised a ton of money in a short period of time because they have access to people with money. And because Me Too went viral, the people who are on the ground doing work have been flooded with. Rape crisis centers, have, their numbers have gone up like 400%. People who are doing community work to end sexual violence cannot literally handle the volume of work that's happening. So we've created this Me Too movement fund. Yeah, I'm going to go here. We've created this Me Too movement fund with the New York Women's Foundation so that we can raise money to support our work, but also to make sure that the people on the ground get money. Mm-hmm. So we have our first round of grantees that we, we, we've only raised a million dollars. Our goal is 25 million. And I'm, I'm actually bringing this up because the- um, She takes cash you. or checks. I do. <laughs> What's his name who was out here? Scott Harrison. Scott Harrison was out here and I was backstage listening to him and he talked about how somebody called him up and gave him a million dollars and I was like, <laughs> Somebody call me up and give me a million dollars, please. I promise you I'm going to take care of your money. (laughs) 
also think it's about finding your allies and finding your team. And, mm. you know, it's so much easier to do this together than it is to do alone. And yeah. you can find yep. the people in your, your, your organization all or you. all around you who, who want to help, who yep. care about this yep. too. Yep. And we're so much stronger together than we are alone. And, and I'm going to end on this note. In terms of the Me Too movement, when you leave here, when you hear somebody say, oh, that's not about me, oh, that's not for us, oh, that's a witch hunt, I need you to say, that's not true. That's not true. I need you to tell them, think about the millions of people. Do you know that 12 million people engaged with the Me Too hashtag in 24 hours on Facebook? In the first 24 hours, 12 million people around the world. And if it had been anything else, if 12 million people said, if we woke up tomorrow and 12 million people caught some communicable disease mm -hmm. and it was like outbreak, like the movie, and you know, it was everywhere, the whole world would stop and everybody, the, our focus would be on how did this happen, how do we stop it, and how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? And we have millions of people who raised their hand last year to say me too, and their hands are still raised. Yep because nobody's paying attention to them. We have a pandemic of sexual violence in this world from sexual harassment to murder. It is really that bad and that dramatic. And so when you go out in the world and you talk about the Me Too movement as some kind of witch hunt or anything else besides what I've described here today, you are doing a disservice to every single one of those. Every hashtag is a human being. And you have to leave here and remember that. These are people's lives that we're talking about. It's people's human dignity that we're talking about. So that's what I would implore you. I know our little time is out, but I'm going to say that when you leave here, talk about this differently. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to thank you both for being here. Thank you. thank you, but we still have a lot of work to do, obviously, yes. but thank you both for the work that you both have done to contribute to even having this conversation. Thank and thank you so much for being at Inbound to, to bring it to this audience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. It was great. <laughs>